Good morning and a very warm welcome to AI UK 2022 live from Victoria in London. I hope you're joining us from somewhere comfortable because we've got a real treat in store on this second day of this national showcase. So if this is your first time attending, AI UK is the UK's national showcase of artificial intelligence and data science research and collaboration. It's hosted, of course, by the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for AI and Data Science Technologies. We hope you're going to be engaged, informed, entertained, and even changed by what you see and hear today. So my name is Anjana Ahuja. I'm a freelance science writer and a columnist for the Financial Times. I love big ideas, and that's why I'm thrilled to be your MC for the conversation stage, because it's here on this stage that we'll be addressing the big questions in AI through interviews, debates, and conversation. So yesterday was a cracker of a day when we heard about acing an AI startup, challenges around diversity and skills, and the role of AI in war and peace. And who can forget the game show? I'm still hankering after Gavin's golden jacket. That was a lot of fun, and today we're going to have a whole lot more. So today we're starting with a conversation with some powerful women in AI, and it's my pleasure to welcome back Tabitha Goldstorb to host our opening session. Tabitha is chair of the AI Council and co-founder of Cognition X. Tabitha advocates for more diversity in tech, and she recently wrote How to Talk to Robots, a girl's guide to a world dominated by AI. She's also co-founder of Future Girl Corp, and an advisor to teens in AI and on the board of Tech UK. So, Tabitha, welcome and let's get this show on the road. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Breakfast with the Office for AI. The session with Sana Karagani, the head of the Office for AI. I am incredibly excited um, to get the opportunity for the two of us to talk. Because, uh, yes, we do talk a lot, but nice to talk with an audience. Um, Sana's a rare breed in government. Having studied computer science and getting an MBA at MIT, she's got over 20 years experience in business, working as both a software engineer and a management consultant before coming to government. She came to the Office for AI from the government's digital service and both created and grew the Office for AI team to deliver programs under the near 100, uh, sorry, 1 billion uh, sector deal. This includes the creation of the AI Council on which, uh, as you just heard, I am the chair. And really, the journey since the AI Review in 2017, written by Dame Wendy Hall, has almost been the story of our lives. An amazing story, and one I'm excited to touch on briefly before we dig into what the future holds for AI in the UK. It's important that you also get to ask your questions, so please do use the Q&A on the side there, and I will make sure we get to them in the chat. But first, Sana, let's go back to sort of almost the beginning, our beginning. Um, tell me, how did we get to where we are today? Hi, Tabitha, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to, to be here and to chat to you, um, like you said, with an audience. Um, <clears throat> so a quick recap, the Office for AI is the central policy and delivery team in government, um, really focused on driving the uptake of AI technologies across the wider economy. Um, for those that don't know us, we're a joint unit. We sit between the Department for Digital <coughs> Culture, Media and Sport. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still battling COVID as well. And the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, we've been around since 2018. And since then we've been building the foundations to help grow the AI industry in the UK. Um, starting with delivering the commitments in the sector deal that you talked about. Um, and then a lot of work since then on increasing access to skills, access to data, driving adoption, international collaboration and leadership by the uh, UK's AI Council. Um, around a year, to, year ago, based on the recommendations from the AI Council's roadmap, which was published, um, ministers agreed that it was important for the UK to have a national strategy to really remain at the forefront of AI globally. So uh, we in the Office for AI, we set to work and we published the strategy last September during London Tech Week. Quite a uh, serious journey. And I believe we're now on to the next chapter, aren't we? Yes, 
Uh, yes, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I think probably a good time to let people know that I am actually uh, stepping down and I'll be leaving the Office for AI uh, after four years. Um, I am returning to the private sector. Um, over the past four years, I've managed to build a very capable team. Um, they are incredibly respected across government and I hope by the ecosystem. Um, for me, making sure that technology works for people, um, that's really my passion. Um, and the strategy uh, has, has outlined how we can do that for the whole of equipment, for the whole of the economy. So public and private sectors working together to deliver on those ambitions. And now I'm, I'm taking a, a role um, at a company pushing the envelope of cutting edge technology, uh, balancing that with improving um, what tech can deliver for society, whether it be via sustainability or otherwise. So I'm excited about the new challenge. Yeah, well, I can definitely attest to what a wonderful team you've built and how well respected they are by the community. Um, I think we all we all absolutely adore them. And I'm so excited for you. And I think I can speak for probably everybody and saying how excited we are for you. And I, I, I like to think that you've kind of gone and enacted the second pillar of the AI strategy. You know, it's all about adopting, <laughs> adoption, cutting edge technologies, supporting startups. And you're like, oh, OK, I'll, I'll go and do that. So you've uh, you've drunk your own uh, you've drunk your own medicine and i love it so um i'm really i'm really thrilled for you everyone is um yeah. but before we let you go we need you to uh, tell us what's next so what we're going to do for the next um few minutes is i want to dig into the pillars in the strategy and um give everyone a feel for the next phase and 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 what government's doing now it's in delivery mode of the strategy but also what they as individuals can do to lean in as academics, business people, and so on, to make sure that the strategy really comes to life. Um, the three pillars, as everyone knows, first, the long-term foundation, uh, second, the governance, and third, the benefits, um, making sure that they you know, reach all sectors and regions. So we'll, 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 we'll rattle through those. Um, let's start, Sana, with the, um, you know, the, the foundational needs of the AI ecosystem. This section has got a huge array of things that need to be done. Skills, talent, research and development, access to data, compute, finance, VC and trade. I mean, it's, it's a bumper uh, list of things that need to be achieved. What are some of the initiatives that you've already been, um, you know, are underway, set in motion? And, and what are you hoping can be delivered in the rest of this year? Thanks, Tabitha. You're you're absolutely right. So we are <clears throat> in that next phase, um, and you know, me stepping down or away, etc. Nothing is changing. Um, that there is a full force pushing ahead. Um, so delivering on the strategy really requires proper collaboration, not just across government, but um, across the whole of the economy. So across government and industry working together and, um, and everything like that. And it's also not just about a bit of the system talking to itself. Um, so one of the key areas that we've been working on over the past um, little while has been to ensure that there's appropriate investment in skills um, to help move the dial on, on diversity um, in the AI workforce. Um, we worked with the Office for Students to create postgraduate conversion courses for master's students. Um, and this is, includes scholarships for students from underrepresented groups, be it, you know, for example, women, Black or disabled students. Um, and in the autumn budget, uh, budget the Chancellor announced an, a, an extra bit of funding, 23 million, to double the number of scholarships to 2,000. Um, he also announced um, increasing the number of Turing fellowships uh, as well to attract and retain the best and brightest minds here to the UK to help us train the next generation of innovators. Um, I, I'm obviously not going to go into detail about all of the areas within this, uh, this, this pillar, as you mentioned, it's enormous <laughs> um, because it is the foundations, right? And we, you know, what we wanted to set out was the, the, the importance of everything that sits at the core of getting the AI ecosystem to thrive and, and the things that we uh, in government but also in industry need to focus on will change as time moves on um, but for now a few of the things that we've been doing um, another thing that we've been working on is is getting kind of 
understanding IP. So in October, we launched a consultation on copyright and patent le legislation for AI through the IPO. Um, this has now closed and responses are being collated and analyzed. In November, the government's central digital and data office, which exists in the cabinet office, developed and published one of the world's first algorithmic transparency standards for use in the public sector. In November, Chris Philp, who is the Minister for Technology and the Digital Economy, announced a one million pounds of funding for data governance research. This involves 12 pilot partners from low and middle income countries. You're going to hear more about this later when um, Minister Philp is speaking um, at AI UK later this afternoon. So do tune in for that. Um, also in December, government took its first major step towards reviewing the AI governance landscape. Uh, the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation published its AI Assurance Roadmap, um, and that was complemented in January this year with the announcement of the UK's AI Standard Hub, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, there are commitments, like you said, around skills, around data, around infrastructure, around R&D investment, and around leveling up. These are all things that have been spoken about um, across different government publications, as well as the AI strategy. There's a lot that relies on the whole of government and the wider economy to work together. But the next step is, is really going to be about publishing the action plan, um, which we are going to be doing very soon, which sets out kind of what government is doing in the short term to, to start um, actioning some of these things. And that, that's, um, it's very exciting. And I think we've all, um, my favorite part of the strategy, as you know, was the next steps, because it promised all these, um, it promised all these sort of checks and balances and ways of making sure that um, government is, uh, you know, delivering on, on the commitments it made in the strategy. How does an action plan work for those who don't know, um, for the, those who don't know about this process? Yeah, so, <clears throat> well, we call it an action plan um, rather than a delivery plan because it, it is about taking action and yes. doing things, right? Um, and I think that the point of um, us putting together an action plan was really to, to showcase that uh, what government is doing as a whole. So what are the, the, the different bits of, um, of government now doing in order to, to push forward um, uh, on the three pillars of the strategy? Um, one of the commitments that uh, was made in the Prime Minister's Council um, was that delivering the strategy would be would take a whole of government effort. So it's not just about the Office for AI sitting um, and pushing policy out. It's about, you know, what is the NHS, uh, what is DHS do, DHSC doing, what is um, Department, for De uh, Department for Defense doing, what is um, the Ministry of Defense doing, what is the... Um, uh, department for Transport doing, etc. And so what the action plan is going to try and do is, is demonstrate um, the actions that are being taken across government. I'm thrilled to hear that because I think I, I get asked a lot, um, is this just the Office for AI? And I say, no, 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 it's a whole <laughs> government coordinated effort. So it's, it's good to hear you say that. Let's move on to the third pillar and we'll come back to the second in a moment. The third pillar is obviously about getting AI governance right. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that tension between pro-innovation and protecting the rights of individuals, society, harms, and so on. What can we expect from the white paper that you have coming out? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's really important. I mean, I, let me kind of set this all up first, right? Um, I, I really don't think there's any need for governance and regulation to be at loggerheads, right? Um, there, uh, you know, having the right governance landscape for AI encourages innovation to flourish within clear boundaries that are set to protect the rights of individuals and society. And loads has been done on this already. Since 2017, the government established the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation to look at issues um, and, and potential gaps in policy around the use of data and AI. The center has published a whole bunch of reports relevant to AI already. This is like the algorithmic bias report, two editions of the AI barometer. Um, they've worked with the information commissioner's office to produce a guide on explain explainability of AI systems. The office for AI is also using ethics and putting it at the center of our work. So for, we talked about conversion courses. It, you know, Dame Wendy Hall always says, if it's, uh, if it's not diverse, it's not ethical. Um, we worked with the Open Data Institute to facilitate data sharing for social benefit and economic ones. So this is around um, 
the building of data trusts. And this is an idea that's been picked up by others. And again, more that you'll hear more about this later through today. We worked with the World Economic Forum to develop a framework for um, responsible public sector procurement of AI. This has been in internationalized um, and it's called AI procurement in a box. Um, it's being used by other governments uh, across the world who are like-minded to ourselves. And it's actually been used here in the UK to produce our own set of AI procurement guidelines. And now, as you mentioned, um, one of the pillars of the strategy is about getting AI governance right. Um, and this pillar has had an enormous amount of early focus. Um, new and clear regulations for AI are not only are they going to improve public perception of the technology and mitigate any new risks, but they will also do this without actually stifling innovation, right? Um, but also I think that the key here is to remember that it's not just about regulation. Um, we are, we're looking at the wider AI governance landscape. So we're looking at, uh, which includes kind of technical standards, um, assurance and institutions with appropriate oversight. Um, these are all areas where the UK has long led the world. Um, I mentioned, sorry, go on, Tabitha. No, you go, I was just going to say, it's a fascinating time. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, look, we, it, it, you know, I've mentioned some of these things, but I thought I might go into a little bit more um, ex, uh, detail about some of them. So I, I talked about the um, algorithmic transparency standard in November. Um, in December, we the the um, Center for Data Ethics published their roadmap to AI assurance, um, and they're really looking at uh, how can this become an economy within the UK as well. So this is about assurance services like audit and certification to help AI users know that the tools they're using are effective. Um, that they're, they're not only effective, but trustworthy and legal. Um, and it was a deliverable that we'd set out in the strategy. Um, in January, the Alan Turing Institute in being supported by the National Physics Lab and the B British Standards Institute um, started piloting the AI Standards Hub. This is about the UK contributing to the development of global AI technical standards and working together with other countries in the world to make sure that technical standards are shaped by experts globally and not just one country driving their own kind of agenda or focus. And, and finally, as you mentioned, we are publishing the, the, strand, um, the white paper later this year. Um, and we really believe that providing clarity about how the UK expects to govern AI within the UK, um, it will provide certainty um, and it will allow businesses to innovate and AI developers to continue to transform the economy, but not just transform it, transform it with confidence um, and, and be able to transform it in a way that um, benefits the whole of society with, with the right guardrails in place. So that's our hope for the, for, for the work that we're doing with the white paper. And my, my hope too, and I'm, I'm thrilled that the, um, the AI council get to lean in and, uh, support you on that and, and obviously um, bring the rest of the community into that, those discussions too. And beautifully takes us on to the, the second pillar and the final pillar that we're gonna talk about today, which is around ensuring AI benefits all sectors and regions. Uh, the ecosystem is incredibly complicated. Um, you know, the, 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 the tensions that you have between the kind of feeling like a wild west, no one knowing where to start. What are the challenges that you've seen to adoption at the moment? I mean, you're, you, you couldn't be more right. Um, there, is a, there is a lot going on, right, um, across government. And, uh, and, and, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is allow, allow this to happen, but also be able to, to kind of put some rhyme and reason around why things are happening and, and put some structure around it, which is what, what the pillars are hopefully helping do. Um, I mentioned the strategy was about kind of keeping AI, uh, you know, keeping the UK uh, leading kind of AI globally. Um, and, and we were starting from a good place, right? Uh, we, we had the sector deal uh, behind our belt. Um, and also, I mean, the UK has, uh, has a super long legacy in all of this. Um, you know, not only from kind of Alan Turing's work and to people like Jeffrey Hinton or um, the fact that we've got natural language processing and, and kind of earlier forms of machine learning and, and expert systems, but 
computers in general, right? So there's a huge, huge legacy. Um, and then not, we've got preeminent um, AI businesses. So I'm going to name a few of them. Um, we've got DeepMind, GraphCore, Benevolent, Improbable, Darktrace. There's loads, right? Um, we're really recognized as a global leader, ranked third in the world behind US and China in, in global rankings, home to a third of, the, of Europe's AI companies. Um, we have twice as much VC investment in companies compared to France and Germany combined. We have more than 1,300 AI companies with a collective turnover of almost 2 billion. That's a 600% increase in the number of firms only in the last decade. Um, and the government spent a huge amount of money, invested a huge amount of money into AI uh, across a range of initiatives from 2014. So this is in, in excess of 2.3 billion. So this goes from kind of funding for the NHS um, AI lab to accelerate safe adoption of AI in health and care um, to the work we've been doing in connected autonomous mobility and um, in the Department for Transport, attracting the best and brightest minds here to the UK in the Turing AI fellowships and conversion courses, increasing the number of PhDs by doing all of the, the centers for doctoral training across the country. Um, and then, you know, the Hartree Center, which leverages additional private investment funding to, to help push conversion, uh, high performance compute, et cetera. But also the government, um, the strategy itself committed to launch it, launching a national AI research and innovation program with the UKRI. Um, and this is really about collaboration between the country's researchers to help transform the UK's AI capability. So this is really about bringing all of that research and, and putting a, a collective strategy around it and, and making sure it's all driving and pushing in the same um, direction. Not so much creating a single front door, right? Because that's relatively impossible. Um, we also wanna push AI outside of being just in London and the Southeast, right? So this is about focusing commercialization um, elsewhere and, and into sectors that haven't um, been at the forefront of the adoption of these, but have massive potential, so like energy or farming. Um, and the, the leveling up white paper that just came out committed to 55% of public R&D being spent outside of the Southeast. Um, but you can see, I mean, um, and you knew already, right, that the, the space is incredibly complex. Yeah. Um, there's no really one single solution for doing this. Um, I think they're, uh, you know, we, it, it, in fact, I think it might be a good time to bring Sara in <laughs> and, 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 and talk to Sara about what 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 um, um, Innovate's doing on, on some you, of these questions. You, you, you've just laid out, I think, the challenge incredibly well. And, and how do people then navigate that, um, that landscape you've just described? And luckily, um, we have uh, Sara um, El Hanfi with us from Innovate um, UK, who has been working with, with you, and I've been very lucky to be involved, um, to a bit of a solution to the challenge that you've just set. Um, Sara, tell me a little bit more about this, um, the, the solution we've been cooking up. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, as Sana has already set out, we, we do have a hugely vibrant AI ecosystem in the UK and there's a huge amount of activity happening, you know, across the ecosystem. But it is difficult to know everything that's happening and, and, and not just working in those different siloed parts. So it probably goes back a few years at UKRI. So Innovate UK is part of UK Research and Innovation. And we conducted an AI review to help us better understand our existing AI portfolio, but also what our role should be in the landscape moving forward. Um, and as part of that review, we consulted uh, hundreds of external stakeholders from across academia, business, um, across disciplines, across sectors. And I think it got us all thinking, both UKRI, but also the Office of AI, AI Council, about how the lack of connectivity could be limiting the brilliant minds that we have in the UK and the organisations that are already doing amazing things. But what else could they be doing if the ecosystem was better connected and easier to navigate? So really excited to announce that we've been developing um, a tool to map the AI landscape to make it easier for the ecosystem to find information or to find partners to collaborate with. And we have a, a teaser video, which I think we're going to play. 
Yes, we are. Um, we're just waiting for it to be uh, teed up. Tell, tell, tell us what the, um, what the plan is for it, and then uh, they're hopefully going to play it. <laughs> of course. Um, so we're, we're hoping to launch the tool in summer, but like all things, this really needs the engagement and involvement of the AI community to be a successful, which I think is why um, we were all very excited to be able to announce the, the plan to launch this later in the year today. So we, you know, we've got everyone here, um, you know, interested in AI in the UK. Um, so there'll be um, a hashtag, which is on the video. Uh, so UK Wayfinder, so WAI, so shoehorned AI in there. Um, and that will give you further announcements and um, let people keep people updated with how they can get involved. Yeah. And also people can tell us what they think about the uh, the name Wayfinder with the AI, which I think we thought was rather smart. Um, let's play the video. And that's just the beginning, isn't it? When um, remind me, when can everyone see the first um, the first uh, version of the Wayfinder? We'll be launching it in summer this year. So um, yeah, so please follow the hashtag, um, keep your eyes peeled, and we'll be updating you as soon as possible with more information. Thank you so much for joining us to tell us that, Sara. I've got one last question for Sana, so we'll see you uh, backstage later, Sara. Thank you. Thank you. So Sana, I mean that's quite uh, a an awesome legacy. Um, the the uh, the tool to to bring everyone together, I think, is pretty much um, something that you and I might have spoken about the first night we met. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I love it, and I love that it. it's called the Wayfinder. Good. Well, I'm glad we'll uh, we'll soon get feedback. Um, what before we you know before we uh, leave everyone i want to hear your final your your final words potentially publicly in this role um about your hopes for ai in the uk and one thing we need in order to achieve them yeah um so my hopes for ai in the uk is for it to continue to thrive um as it has been um because i think it is uh it really is magical that the kinds of things that these technologies can do, that the kinds of global challenges that these technologies can help us uh, fix. And one way, I mean, I think I've mentioned this already a few times in, in, in what I've said today, which is it, this is not just about one or two people talking to each other. This is about all of us, right? It's about um, public discourse. It's about making sure the public feels comfortable and safe in, in using these technologies. It's about making sure um, all bits of government are working together and collaborating to deliver on the strategy. It's about making sure um, the economy and our academics um, continue to, to, to do the most amazing, like to commercialize the most amazing um, research, but also to continue doing this um, amazing research, right? It's, it's that collaboration, it's that pulling together that's really going to make the UK continue to stand out um, in, in how it's doing. And I, I, I look forward to watching um, how things go and, and reading about it and then also contributing in, in, um, in my new role um, in helping push these forward. So, yeah, very, very excited. Um, I, I see this as an incredibly bright future for the UK. Um, and it, it's it's one of the things we spoke about um, it, within the Office for AI and the AI Council, which is we need everyone to be thinking about this. So living with it, working with it and using it. So we will definitely be holding you to uh, to your part in your new role. I, I um, I'm thrilled. Um, I'm thrilled that you said that. Uh, I think you're you're right. We have this incredible strategy now. It is all about getting behind it um, collectively. Uh, I'm thrilled we got to launch uh, or announce the um, the soon to launch uh, Wayfinder today with you, and I hope that you will see 
you know, we'll see many, 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 many events to come just with a different hat on. Um, thank you, Sana, so much. Uh, we will see, see you soon. And thank you everyone for listening. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure being at AI UK yet again. And uh, I hope we'll be back next year. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Tabitha. Thank you very much for having me.